Thank you. So thank you so much for organizing the conference. It's really nice. And uh, this one is not my most. <laughs> Close the door, please. So this is not one of my most recent papers, um, but I, it's been actually around the first version a couple of years ago, and I've been toying with these ideas for, for longer. But I picked it because it's the one that is closest to what I worked uh, during my PhD with Jean-Francois, uh, which was about, generally speaking, cooperation uh, with asymmetric information. That's kind of my last work uh, on this topic. and. Uh, I'm in the process of revising it. So I said it would be the most appropriate for this uh, conference. And it's trying to, to push a bit uh, an agenda of research, which has not been pursued very much uh, in the literature, which is about, generally speaking, social choice in mechanism design. And in particular here, I'm going to study the question of egalitarianism. So there are examples for also. We have very classic examples in economics. I mean, a big part of economics since the early 70s is about information. Uh, and so it's a typical example, kind of Akerlof kind of example. So even one would be owning a good with some probability equal four fifths. It's a low quality good, low quality car, second hand car, for instance. With the uh, probability one fifth, it's a high quality good. And the realization price of the two individuals, the owner and the other individuals, which is a potential buyer, depend on the quality of that car. And here are specific numbers for the example. Now, of course, there's been a lot of work on this kind of toy example. And we understand pretty well what is feasible, what kind of contracts are feasible in this <laughs> setting. Um, so in particular, uh, one class of results that exist uh, in mechanical design are impossibility results, right? To say, well, for instance, Myerson Satos weight in this kind of environment, you cannot find a contract which is first best efficient, so getting the good trade. Notice that with these values, actually, whatever the quality of the car, it's always profitable to trade, right? So the individual number two is always valuing the good more than individual number one. So first best efficiency would mean the good, the good would be traded at whatever uh, the quality of the car. And so first best efficiency with incentive constraints, so leading individual one to reveal his information truthfully, and interim dual rationality that is having the agents willing to participate given the information, that's incompatible. That's Myerson Satos way. So that's a big part of the literature is about impossibility results. And there's another part which is saying, well, but there are still things that are feasible, right? So there are incentive compatible contracts in this problem. And then we define second best efficiency. Uh, and, and, but if you look at the second best efficiency, there's still many contracts which are in fact second best efficient, I put a graph here, actually, I, I try to represent the space of utility, what are all the contracts which are what you call interim incentive efficient, so somehow the best one you could think of. So this graph, you have to read it. Um, these are interim utilities of the participants. Individual two does not know the quality of the car, so you will have only one utility number for him because he's computing expected utility. Uh, player one, on the other hand, knows the quality of the object he's owning, so that's why you have two axes. You have to write down what's the utility of that individual if he knows that the good is of low quality, what if it's of high quality. And if you com compute the incentive constraints uh, and look at what are the feasible contracts you can, you can make, you will get a, a convex polyhedron in the space of utilities. And here I just represented the uh, incentive efficient uh, contracts that you can reach. And so you see there's still a lot of things that are feasible. And the question is, which one are you going to pick out of that set? Right. And, and that's surprising. If you look at the literature, there's very little about that question. Very, very few answers provided for that question. I have another example here with a public good production. So you have a public project. By the way, I restrict always to two agents in, in these examples. You can have many more ex agents, obviously. But I want to make graphs. So with uh, two agents is the maximum I can deal with. Uh, so again, a public project, it has some costs. It will have some benefit for sure, 90 for the second individual. But for the first one, you don't know exactly what's the uh, benefit. And again, you could look at the interim incentive efficient uh, 
mechanism, and if you plot it in the space of utilities, you get this kind of sets, and then you're wondering, but which contract are you going to pick? So economics of information so far has been making great progress regarding what is feasible, and that's either with impossibility results, saying, again, myerson satos way kind of result, like we cannot achieve all these good properties together, or trying to understand the revelation principle, for instance, what is feasible, and then um, trying to understand what is maybe efficient. But there's nothing much more than that, except when you have to pick a specific outcome, what the literature is doing is looking at very specific modes of interaction. So a situation like a principal agent problem. So the principal is making a take it or leave it offer to the agent, and that's going to deliver some kind of outcome. Or you are looking at maximizing the profit of an auction here, let's say in auctions, right? But there's basically nothing about social choice. What is, what is fair if you care about all the participants in the economy? What would be a fair outcome? Okay. So I'm, I'm arguing that I find it a bit surprising that it would be worth investigating how you could extend social choice to the question of mechanism design. So if I were to make an analogy, if you want, with the case of complete information, uh, we understand what is feasible. We understand the address box. We understand the contract curve, what we have Pareto, and we understand what, what is uh, efficient. But we don't have anything after that of egalitarianism, utilitarianism. Which point are you going to pick out of the contract curve, basically? And, and surprisingly, very vast literature on social choice are virtually nothing on that question. So I want to investigate a bit that. In particular, in this paper, I'm going to focus on the egalitarian principle. Uh, and in particular, instead of just giving definition, I mean, I'll give you some definitions of, of principles, but I would like to think in terms of axioms. I think it's an interesting way of thinking about a problem. The axioms can be helpful to extend a solution concept. So once we understand well what, are, what does egalitarianism means through basic properties like axioms, you could ask, what is the natural extension? How does this axiom apply in the larger context, for instance, with asymmetric information, and try to figure out what is the implication of that axiom. Quickly, related literature. Now, there's a, a pretty vast literature on questions of fairness or uh, social choice with risk. So it goes back, of course, to Arzani's uh, key paper on utilitarianism. Um, and then the criticism by Diamond. So Arzani was characterizing utilitarianism is behind the veil of ignorance, so before you realize some uncertainty about your position in the, in the society. And Diamond was criticizing it by saying, but it doesn't care at all about equity or equality. Uh, and then you have various elaborations on these ideas. So these are questions about what happens when what is fair when people are facing uncertainty, but uncertainty with symmetric information. So it's kind of an arrow de Breu framework, if you were to think in terms of economics. Uh, so if you want the question of fairness with arrow de Breu framework has been studied quite a bit, but again, nothing about asymmetric information. Feasibility has been, of course, studied extensively in particular. Here I put the, the <laughs> classic citation, citation for the revelation principle. Efficiency has, is also pretty well understood, and one commonly accepted notion is in terms of efficiency, Balonstrom and Meyerson. But what next, right? So what else can you do? Now, the, I found only actually one paper really dealing with the question of which kind of criterion should you use and from an axiomatic point of view. It's a paper by Klaus Nering, who is extending essentially the Arzani classic result, the, the one I listed on the previous uh, page, to asymmetric information. So his result, roughly speaking, is the following. It's a quite different setting from mine. It's actually looking at social welfare ordering, but he's saying, if you want a social welfare ordering, which is consistent with exposed utilitarian uh, comparisons. So you, you start is saying, well, I like utilitarianism. So I'm going to say, suppose that I'm in a situation when I'm comparing two different states, uh, two different uh, contracts. Suppose that state by state exposed, contract number one has a higher utilitarian welfare than the second contract. Then I feel, that's his axiom, I feel that at the interim stage, before they learn information, um, I feel that at the interim stage, contract one should be ranked above contract two. So that's one of his axioms, the consistency with exposed utilitarian comparisons. Okay. And the second axiom he's putting is to say, I would like my social welfare ordering at the interim stage, when people have private information, to be consistent with interim Pareto comparisons. 
So it wants to be consistent with the uh, criterion of uh, Armstrong and Myerson. And he's saying, it's a surprising result, it's an extension of uh, Arzani's wizard, saying there's a unique way to uh, do this. It actually requires to have a common prior. And when you have a common prior, the unique way to satisfy these two properties is actually to maximize the exante utilitarian criterion. That is even before people learn their private information. So you have, it's a little bit going back to the behind the veil of ignorance. No, it's actually behind even the veil of ignorance reg regarding behind before learning your private information. So that's his result. I have a small paper because I, I was looking at the paper. I thought at the beginning when I when I read it the first time that would be a great way to try to extend also other social welfare ordering. So I'm kind of going back to Diamond and say, well, but this does not put any weight on any kind of equality or egalitarianism. So I thought, but maybe we can use this methodology to extend other criteria. So why don't I try to extend the egalitarian criterion by saying, I want first of all to have consistency with exposed egalitarian comparisons. And on top of that, I was I want consistency with the interim Pareto criterion. What is the social welfare ordering that is emerging from that? Well, it turns out nothing. It's always impossible. Actually, in this, in this short note there, I'm showing that if you take any kind of social welfare ordering that cares even a little bit about equity, not just the egalitarian solution, but any kind of social welfare ordering formally that is consistent with the Pigou Dalton uh, criterion in a sixth, strict sense, then there's no way to find a social welfare ordering that will be consistent both with exposed comparison according to that social welfare ordering and consistent at the same time with interim Pareto criteria. So that's not a, the good way to go if you want to talk about some form of equity. And I'm not even talking about egalitarianism in particular, but any kind of social welfare ordering which is putting any kind of weight on equality, uh, even the slightest ways possible, this approach will not work. So we have to forget about it. We have to think of another approach. And I'm going to propose one of them here. Another related literature is the axiomatic. There's a, there's a very small literature, a handful of paper uh, on axiomatic Nash bargaining. And there's always kind of a very different question, of course, bargaining social choice. But there's some kind of like similitude in the frameworks. Uh, and the closest paper maybe is a couple of papers by Meyerson. Uh, on bargaining and incomplete information. In particular, in some of my proofs, but I'm not going to talk about it today, Myerson has been building uh, a lot of his theory on the idea of virtual utility, which maybe some people, some of you know through auctions, but it's actually much more general. He's defining that in much more general terms. And these techniques will be helping me also to prove some of my results. Then the last related bit, actually, and then I'll move on to the framework, is about papers that are just applying a specific criterion. Right? So for instance, myerson satters weight is very well known for the impossibility result. But then they have a second section, which is about, OK, now that we understand we cannot achieve the first best, let's look at the second best. And let's pick one mechanism, which is actually maximizing the exante utilitarian criterion, so exactly the one that Nehring characterized. So you have a few papers out there which are just positing a specific social welfare ordering and are just curious to compute what it gives in specific examples. So I'll have some of that also towards the end of the talk, but the main part of the talk will be about discussing criteria and trying to propose axioms and characterize uh, the criteria um, that I'm proposing, the criteria that I'm proposing. Is there any question about like the general um, idea and the purpose of the talk? No? OK. So I'll start with three slides of describing the model. Um, I might go a little bit too fast to it because I'm just used to these things. But the first time you see it, it might be a little bit of a shock. So don't hesitate to slow me down or to ask me questions if, uh, if it's not clear. If you are familiar with uh, mechanism design, it should be pretty easy. But otherwise, it might be a little bit tougher. Oh. Uh, Remember the sign you have. I think it's telling for people who, who notice it. <laughs> OK, so a mechanism, a mechanism design problem is six tuple with, so first of all, you describe the set of individuals. You describe the set of collective decisions that are available. So you could think of an exchange economy, maybe all the trading opportunities that are available. For instance, the, the used car example I gave you. I will going to think of there is a status quo right now in the society. So if nothing is being done, that's what will prevail. Now you have to capture information. Information is captured in the standard Bayesian setting. So you will have types for each individuals. And the types will be 
telling, so each individual knows his own type, the, does not know the types of the other participants in uh, this problem. And the types uh, will be determining uh, the beliefs via here a common prior. So it's just by Bayesian updating, you will have beliefs regarding the types of the other players. And the collection of all types determine the preference of the participants. And I'm going to think always in, of utilities in terms of gains over the status quo, so I'm going to normalize in that circumstance the utility of the status quo to zero. Now, mechanism, um, so you have to think the, the, the social planner would like to do something. He would like to have some contracts uh, prevail as a function of the information captured by the types. Unfortunately, he does not know the type of the participant. So he cannot just implement whatever he wants. He has to go through a mechanism and as we know, we have the revelation principle, which is telling you all the kind of contracts or outcomes that the mechanic designer or the social planner can um, enforce uh, via some any kind of communication mechanism. So a, a mechanism, here I actually looked only at direct mechanism, is just telling you, asking the participant, tell me what your type is, and as a function of what you're telling me, I'm going to implement a specific decision or possibly a lottery over these decisions. You could even think of more general mechanism where you are asking for uh, more general messages, but as we know from the revision principle I'm going to put soon in the, on the slide, we don't need uh, such generality. Now, if you have a specific mechanism uh, being set new, you can compute the expected utility of individuals if everybody reports the truth, expected given your private information. So remember, player I knows his own type TI, but he does not know the type of the other participants, so he has to, have, he has to form expectations regarding the other participants. So that's why you have this sum over the T minus I, and these are the interim beliefs of player I of type TI, right, through Bayesian updating, and so that's the expected utility of what he's getting from the mechanism. Now, player I, of, of course, could lie, and he could be reporting a different type than his true type. So if he's reporting TI prime instead of TI, he can compute his expected utility in the mechanism. If he's assuming that the other participants are telling the truth, then, of course, the sum is over t minus i, nothing has changed in terms of his beliefs, but what will change is the outcome of the mechanism. He believes that the other participant tell the truth and he's lying, so the, the outcome that will pre prevail is ti prime t minus i. And incentive compatibility, which just means that truth telling is a Bayesian Nash equilibrium of this game, means that telling the truth is at least as good as any kind of lie you could make. Sorry? So the revision principle is telling any kind of outcome you can achieve with any kind of, any Bayesian Nash equilibrium of any kind of mechanism can be replicated by truth telling in a mechanism that is incentive compatible. So I'm going to focus on this result and therefore I can, this result is telling me I can narrow down and focus on those mechanisms that are incentive compatible, namely where truth telling is a Bayesian Nash equilibrium. It's possible that in this mechanism, yeah, so I'm looking at what you call weak implementation instead of full implementation. That's correct. Intermediate rationality means that all the participants are at least as well off as by deciding not to participate. So they're getting at least as much utility as with the D star, the status quo. Uh, so in, in, in other words, you need unanimity for uh, moving away from the status quo. And feasibility will just be the combination of incentive compatibility with individual rationality. And a social choice function, which is what the mechanic designer would like to implement, will be a correspondence sigma that will associate a non-empty set of feasible mechanisms to each mechanism design problem. So for every six tuple S, you are going to associate a subset of the feasible set uh, of, of mechanism. Now I'm actually going to assume that it's essentially single-valued. There could be multiple mechanisms of solution, but all these mechanisms are always giving the same utilities to the participants. So that will be an assumption toward the paper. Of course, it would be interesting to look also without that assumption, but again, it's just a first work in that topic. So for any, kind, for any pair of mechanisms that are solutions for a problem, then for all individuals and whatever the private information, they get the same utility in both mechanisms. Okay, is there any question about the framework? Let me move on. So let's talk about axioms now. Okay, so um, the first axiom will be interim incentive efficiency. So that's just directly coming from the paper of Armstrong and Meyerson. That's their concept. So given mechanism design problem, 
um, if you consider mu as a solution to that problem, you don't want to find another mechanism that would make everybody better off at the interim stage. So that's why the comparisons are always for individual i of type ti. If that was the case, that means you would have an alternative that is better for everybody. Or equivalently, it would be common knowledge that there's an alternative that is better. Now I'm going to focus, I told you I want to focus on the egalitarian principle, so I look at the, in the literature what is the, one of the most standard characterization of egalitarianism under complete information. Well, the paper by Kalai, who is saying essentially that the egalitarian principle is the only solution that is anonymous, Pareto efficient, and satisfies the monotonicity property. And the monotonicity property, so first of all, I should say, his paper is what you call a welfareist paper. That is, it's a paper like the Nash bargaining solution, the Nash paper, which is written in the space of utilities, right? So if you think of Nash bargaining, you always think of uh, problems. I don't know if I have a choke here. Right here. So when you think of a Nash bargaining problem, you would always think in terms of utilities of player one, utility of player two, and you would think of a feasible set. So you don't describe explicitly what are the contracts available or the outcomes. You just abstract all of, all of that, and you just think in terms of utilities. That's what you call the welfareist approach. So Kalai is very much in that framework. So this U is a feasible set. So that would be the U, for instance. And Kalai is requiring that if the U expands into a V, which is larger, then no one in the, in the group, in the population, should be worse off. So if you have more opportunities, uh, then everybody should be better off. Okay. Now, I did not start with a welfareist approach in, in this paper, because with a welfareist approach, if you just describe the problem in terms of interim utilities, I cannot talk about incentive constraints, if you want. Right? The incentive constraints are about what would be the uh, person's welfare if he or she was to lie in the mechanism. And therefore, you need to describe the utility functions and the, the payoff that people would get out of the outcomes if they were to lie in the mechanism. So, um, what is the solution here? Is that the big sigma? Or what is the concept you are trying to Yes, the big sigma, that's correct. So what is the small sigma? So, so this is actually in a complete information setting. So in, in the next slide, you will see the definition in my setting. This is just about Kalai's paper under complete information. Uh, so in this setting, the, the little sigma, I, I wrote it little sigma because the welfare is, is just a point on the Pareto frontier. Okay. So... So indeed, I want to have the similar kind of axiom you know, under incomplete information in my setting. So I'm going to phrase this axiom in terms of real outcomes, right? And I'm going to say, consider two problems, the six tuples S and S prime, which are identical on all dimensions, except that you have more options in D prime than in D. So the S prime differs from S only in that more collective decisions are available. But for all other aspects of it, preference, types, individuals, everything else is the same. Then I'm requiring that if mu is a solution of the, what I would call the small problem, and mu prime is a solution of the large problem, then all the individuals should be at least as well off with the mu prime than with the mu, again, at the interim stage, given their private information. Okay. So that is the axiom I, I'm looking at. And unfortunately, the first result is a negative result which is to say that there is no social choice function that satisfies interim efficiency and monotonicity in this framework. Now, if the result ended there, it's not that interesting, actually, because there are old results, uh, going back, actually, if you look in the book of Luch and Haifa already, which is saying that, actually, efficiency and monotonicity are two properties that are difficult to uh, meet at the same time. Now, you are going to say that's a bit surprising. Why, why does this is not a maximization problem. You have incentive. The moment this you change is, D, the moment you change D, we are changing equilibrium, we are changing everything. No, I, I, I disagree. Why, why do you want everybody to Sergio, change? Sergio, I disagree. Okay, when, so, so convince me, why does this make sense? So you don't change incentives. If I have a... It's a, it's a completely new problem. There is a deep time now. Anything, so anything that was feasible in the previous problem remains feasible. Any mechanism that is incentive compatible given the D is still incentive compatible. If you did not want to lie given the D, you, when you are lying, and the mechanism is defined over D, you cannot get to D prime. You, you cannot suddenly get an outcome which is not an outcome of your D, mechanism. Just a second. D is a set of feasible... It's okay, I'll shout. So, 
these are set of possible outcomes, right? Yes, that's right. So you have to think of it of like what is feasible in your economy, of, of like real outcomes. So the trades that you so can... You say the set of, okay. So you say that the set of payoff vectors that are feasible... And Not payoff. The, the these are real outcomes. Social insurance. These are like trades. It's like yesterday in your talk, the trades that are feasible. It's the adjust box. No, no. But in the end, you are comparing utilities. Yes. That's correct. So we, are, That's we are in payoff space. So no, the at the end, the mu, is, the mu is not in the payoff space. You evaluate a mu each, so via you utility. Each mechanism to uh, payoff vector for all players and all, for all types of all players. That's correct. That's what it is. That's what the mu is doing. The assumption is that there is only one such payoff vector. That's correct. So really, we are in a in a in a summation of pi uh, dimensional space. Yes, okay. that's correct. That's what it is. Okay. So now I'm saying. The fact that the, now we now look at only certain compatible mechanisms. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that set when you go from D to D prime, the set of feasible payoff vectors in that space only increases. That's correct. Yeah. Obviously, anything that was incentive compatible involving yeah, outcomes okay, in. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, no. I, because I, I, I understood it T differently. Okay. 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 Let's say I, uh, yeah. So ultimately, I'm going exactly. Okay. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. In the when on every in the agent normal. Yes, that's correct. That's exactly right. So I think this result of incompatibility of these two properties are, exist already kind of in the literature under complete information. It's a little bit misleading, like it's a little bit weird because I told you a moment ago, Kalai characterized the gate and solution with these two properties. So what is going on? Well, look at the example of, of RIFA. Again, the space of utility. This is complete information, right? So the example of RIFA is very simple. It's to say, well, suppose that you have a problem where maybe the only outcome would be an outcome that is pretty favorable to player one, rather unfavorable to player two, and all what you can do is contracts are contracts which are lotteries maybe over these two points. Then obviously efficiency will tell you, well, the outcome should be this outcome over here. That should be the solution, right? I mean, it, Pareto efficient is the only Pareto efficient point. Now think of the symmetric problem, another problem, different problem, where the outcome would be, the only available efficient outcome will be very favorable to player two, but less to player one, which would be here. Now efficiency would tell you, oh, the outcome of this new problem should be here. But if now you think of the larger problem where you can choose either this outcome or that one and any lottery over it, what you can do is any point in this triangle, but if you want monotonicity, you want your outcome of the new problem, the solution of the new problem, to be above both the solution of problem one and above the solution of problem two, which is, has nothing feasible there. So that was the example of RIFA. So how come that Kala is characterizing the uh, efficient, the egalitarian solution with these two axioms? Well, it's because he's putting an assumption on the feasible set of this problem that it needs to be comprehensive, let's say, or that you have a minimal transferability. That is, whenever you are at a point, you can always make player one, let's say, strictly better off. Maybe at a great expense to player two, but there's always a way to go here, there's a way to go there. Okay, so your problem should never be uh, of the kind of, of RIFA. Okay. So here, these results, if, if it was just ending there, I would not be surprising because you could just write the RIFA example. This has nothing to do with incomplete information so far. What is more surprising is that this incompatibility of the two axioms actually occurs even on the class of quasi-linear mechanism design problems. So even if you have pure transferable utility, which is like, the per like if you have complete information, these are like the simplest problem, right? You just say you are going to pick an efficient outcome and then make transfers so as to, to split, for instance, the proceeds equally. That, of course, is monotonic, right? I mean, you're always doing equal splits. Uh, so of course, with quasi-linear utilities, it's like an extreme transferability of utility. Of course, these two properties are compatible, uh, and that's not a problem. But with incentive constraints, this becomes a problem. So I'm, I'm trying to, with this result, to highlight that the presence of incentive constraints make life much more difficult here, okay? And it's actually not just the presence of incentive constraints, it's actually the combined presence of incomplete information and incentive constraints. Now you're going to say, what does that mean? I mean, if you have incentive constraints, that's asymmetric information. Well, you could think of a problem which is, we are at the interim stage, we have private information, but we are going to write contracts which are contingent on a state that will be realized tomorrow, right? Think of, I mean, we're going to make trading uh, on, some, on the level of crops tomorrow. Uh, we could have private information regarding what will be the crops tomorrow, and we could write a contingent contract on that. That's a case where you have private information, there's asymmetric information, but no incentive constraints. You can write any contingent contract you want, right? If you are in that situation, the two axioms are compatible. 
Now you could think of another timing, which is there are incentive constraints, but we are going to write the agreement before I learn the private information. That's what you call an exante contracting. So today, we are thinking of a contract about tomorrow after we learn some private information, and tomorrow we will have incentive constraints and we will use a mechanism. In that setting, again, the two properties are compatible. So it's really the presence of both the incentive constraints and the fact that we have private information that is making these two axioms incompatible. And that feature is very similar to myerson sato's weight impossibility result. There too, if you cancel one of the two channels, the impossibility result disappears, and you can achieve first best uh, efficiency and, in, and uh, in term in, in poor rationality. OK, so that, that's the example. That's the proof. Uh, thank you. So what is going on with incentive constraints and incomplete information? Yes. Uh, so you mean with private information? Uh, I don't think that's, I, I would have to check, but I don't think it depends on that, no. So what, what is going on in this example? I didn't go through the example, but I give you a, a rough intuition of what is going on, because everybody is aware, more or less, with asymmetric information, you have information on rents, right? So you have situations where you have to pay put it very loosely, you have to pay a type of an agent to get it to reveal the information. So that means that even though you have perfect transferability in terms of physical outcomes in your problem, you can make any kind of transfer you want in terms of outcomes, the incentive constraints are putting restrictions on what you can achieve at the interim stage, which is preventing some kind of transfers. So if you were to say maybe, well, I feel as the social planner, that the, high t the, the owner of the car, when it's a high quality car, should get a little bit less surplus and should give more surplus to the second individual. Well, there might be in some situation that you are unable to do that because if you take money away from this high type of uh, individual one, you are going to break the incentive constraints and make the low type one to lie or vice versa. Okay. So, so you have to be careful the incentive constraints are restricting what you can do. It was, it was visible already on my very first graph that I put on, on the board there. Right? These, these were examples precisely with transferable utility. Right? Any kind of transfer, it was simple. It can 101 trading problem, but with asymmetric information. And you see that even though there's perfect transferability or utility, the efficiency frontier here is a triangle. It's not like a whole hyperplane. The incentive constraints are putting a real limit on the kind of compromise you can make between different individuals and different types of individuals, like you said in the uh, agent um, type agent uh, formulation of it. So what can we do now? So that's, that's the, the first result, which is kind of emphasizing what are difficulties that people will face if they try to extend social choice to asymmetric information. Well. Let me propose a criterion, and then I'm going to propose to you a weakening of monotonicity and some axioms that will partially characterize this criterion. So let me call a mechanism mu uh, interim, um, to say that the mechanism mu satisfies the interim egalitarian criterion if it is incentive efficient. We always want that. And remember, the social planner does not know the, the types of the participant. He ignores completely what the T is, the full profile, the full vector T, right? So we are going to require that whatever the T might be, whatever the whole profile, the mechanism designer feels comfortable in the sense that he thinks that the interim utility experienced by any individuals at that T is equal. So for instance, player I, when the true state is T, he knows only Ti, so the utility experienced by player I of that type is, is this number here. And that would be the same as the experience utility by another individual in the society at that specific profile T, for which for J, he knows TJ, and that's the utility experience by that individual. So it's kind of a natural criterion, or one of the natural criteria you could think of. Um, yes? Yes. No, 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 because it's not incentive efficient. So incentive efficient means that you are trying to exploit as much as you can of the problem you are facing. You don't want to leave profit or like gains on the table if you want. Okay? 
Now, there's a second more technical condition. I'm going to skip it because I'm running out of time. Let me tell you that if the, if the set of decision D is finite, this condition is always satisfied. So, But let me call the problem simple. If it admits at least one mechanism that passes this interim criterion and satisfies this condition, we can talk about it uh, during the break. Now, they will not always exist. Not all problems, not all problems are simple. So here I have a couple of conditions under which there exist, uh, under which you are sure that the mechanism design problem is simple. Again, let me skip them because I'm running out of time. And I will just focus in a moment on the examples I introduced at the beginning to show you exactly what the outcome is. Before doing that, let me just tell you I'm going to fix or modify the monotonicity property. So the idea from the example that I proposed, uh, the, the, the theorem I put on the on the slide, which was this incompatibility of interim incentive efficiency with monotonicity, was coming from this problem of transferability of utility at the interim stage, coming from the combination of incentive constraints and incomplete information. So I was saying, well, in some circumstance, the hands of the social planner are kind of tied by the incentive constraints because he or she maybe would like to decrease a bit the satisfaction of let's individual one of type T1 in favor of individual two of type T2, but he cannot do that because if he does that, he's going to break the incentive constraint. So even if he wanted to, he cannot. So he has a physical constraint that is binding uh, for him. So maybe he doesn't want to, and that's fine, but I'm just going to say that I'm going to require monotonicity only in those cases where he's not bound by this kind of constraints. So I'm going to say that interim utilities are transferable at an interim incentive efficient mechanism mu. If for whatever profile of type T you are looking at and whatever pair of different individuals at that type profile, there's a way, there's another mechanism there that is incentive compatible, that is feasible, which is giving a bit more utility or more utilities to individual I of type TI and less to J of type TJ and at least as much to the other one. So that's effectively kind of a transfer. There's a way to make a transfer <laughs> to uh, ITI to JTJ. Kind of, again, this idea of type agent that Sergio mentioned earlier. And I'm going to require restricted monotonicity. is just saying I'm going to require the monotonicity property only in those cases that are not subject to, to this, this problem that might occur. Right? So I'm not saying that monotonicity will not hold at the other problems where you not, don't have transferability. I'm just saying that in those dubious cases, where maybe the mechanism designer would like to do something but cannot, I'm going to say that at those mechanisms, I'm not imposing the, con the, the, the condition. And that's what I call restricted monotonicity. Now, there's another bunch of axioms that I'm putting. Yes. OK. So the axiom, I went fast. OK. No, 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 no. So if uh, whatever that symbol you Everything is the same, except. So this is actually, I should have said, that's the interim utilities. That's the whole vector of interim utilities that the UI of mu ti associated to mu. So what is the, which problem does it apply to which one? Okay. Is it related to the previous slide or not? I, I got something. Yeah, so the previous slide was a definition about what it means to have right. interim utilities to be but transferable. Yeah, you can move, you can move in both directions. And now, and now I'm saying, what, I'm what going to... Here? What does it appear here? This is the exact same as monotonicity. The only thing that changes is that there's more decision in the prime rather than in the original problem. And the only restriction compare, I should have put the previous axiom of monotonicity and show the difference. The only difference is this premise of the condition. If utilities are transferable, if interim utilities are tr transferable. Why does it say transferable? Okay, so I, I didn't, I didn't, I said relative interior. That's, that's an older version actually, I just realized now. So the real statement is, sorry about that. If interim utilities, are transferable in the, sense of the, in the original slide. problem in the sense of previous okay. slides, okay. then you're completely right. It's actually, I did copy paste things yesterday and I realized okay. that I copy paste the wrong thing. Now, this all, I'm going to characterize partially the, this idea of this interim egalitarian criterion um, via additional axioms. Now, the characterization is not perfect against the first uh, paper. But I'm hoping somehow I think that axioms are interesting in this context because it's leading to discussions, right? Some people may like an axiom, may not like. They will propose, they will, they will, it's structuring the discussion. Maybe they will say, what happens if I drop this axiom? What if I replace it by something else? So here's a bunch of axioms, anonymity. I did not even write down what it is because actually it's taking a whole slide if I write it down explicitly. But it's what you think it is. If I change the name of people, the solution should change accordingly. If I change 
the name of the types the solution should change accordingly, and so on and so forth. And the second one is a very big axiom. It's requiring, actually, like Sergio was talking about, that I'm just thinking in terms of, actually, I'm kind of going back to welfareism. Uh, once I understand incentive constraints, I'm going to look at what is feasible in the space of interim utilities. This is the feasible set. These are all the interim utilities achievable in the feasible set. Exhaustivity means that you consider all the mechanisms that are uh, achieving some specific profile of utility. So again, it's a little bit of welfare. Irrelevant splitting of a type, I'm sorry to put all these axioms, but it's the idea, it's going back to a, the paper of Arzani Selton. It's the idea, if you, if you think of a change of modeling, five minutes, thank you, you could always split the type in the sense that you have many ways of modeling complete information. I could have said in the first example where the car is of high quality, I could have said it's the type H1 or the type H2. In both cases, it means that the quality of the car is high. I just label them into two subtypes which have equal probability, which have exactly the same meaning, and I just split the type. Okay, so it's just an, an equivalent reformulation of the model with just a different phrasing of it. Well, if you do this kind of irrelevant splitting, you want your solution to be uh, being consistent with that. IA is the property of IA translated in this setting. So we can talk more about the axioms, uh, but the result is the following. There exists a solution satisfying all these axioms. Okay, So the fact that I went to restricted model city is actually moving away from this impossibility, and there is a solution satisfying all that. But more than that, any solution that satisfies these seven axioms must coincide with the Ethereum egalitarian criterion for simple problems. Okay. The simple problems are those for which there exists an interim egalitarian solution. That is, there is a way to find an interim incentive efficient mechanism which is equalizing the gains. So let me maybe, there's many more things in these papers, uh, but let me maybe go to back to the examples. Uh, given that I have only a couple of minutes left. And let's look in, in the example. This was the public good example that I put. So again, now I can look back at the interim incentive efficient <laughs> set of um, utilities at the interim stage. And I can look at the different outcomes. So if, if you like interim, sorry, if you like exante utilitarianism, you are going to pick a point on this edge of your interim incentive uh, efficiency set. The interim egalitarian criterion, so this is actually a simple problem, right? So the, the, the example I gave is a simple problem because there's a way to equalize the interim utilities of the participant at the mechanism that is interim incentive efficient. So that is the interim egalitarian criterion. Also compute that there's an old paper by Arzaniel Selton. Unfortunately, few people know about it, but it's a very interesting paper. They compute a weighted Nash solution, and that would be their solution there. You can go back also to the trading example that I gave you, right? So very, again, okay, Econ 101 is like the simplest problem you can think of, right? You have two participants. This interval 2 values the good more than interval 1, and the only twist to this example, very basic example, is that there's private information. So this is the, these are the efficient contracts that are feasible in this problem. You wish you could do first best efficiency, but we know it's not feasible. This is, uh, these are all the second best uh, F, uh, contracts that you can reach. If you are exempt utilitarian, you will pick this point down there, okay, which is very favorable to play one with other of a low type. Uh, my, this is again a simple problem because actually it does have an incentive efficient contract which is equalizing the gains of all the participants. And this is the Arzani solution. So indeed, my egalitarian criterion is very much it's close to an idea of Arzani of this type agent form of a problem, which is to say, if you, have, if you remember the, the definition of Bayesian Nash equilibrium, right? Bayesian Nash equilibrium is a Nash equilibrium of the type agent form of the game. So you're thinking of each participant, each player, as having copies which are indexed by the type. So you will have type agents. And then you apply all your standard tools from Nash equilibrium to the type agent form. It's kind of the same here, right? So for each type agent, you think of your tools that you have from social choice, and you compute the egalitarian solution. Now, the paper has many more things. Um, it has a result on how to combine egalitarianism and utilitarianism by rescaling the utilities. 
and that's leading to actually its new characterization of the Arzani Sultan solution. It's also trying to highlight that there are new interesting questions about what does fairness or egalitarianism means under incomplete information. Uh, so you could think of other principles, for instance, what if you try to equalize what the people think they are going to get a share of the surplus. So, so this solution is very much, again, the type agent form and thinking from the point of view of an uninformed social planner trying to equalize things, but you could think of other principles. And I invite you to, to look at the paper if you're interested. There's a, a section discussing these alternative uh, ideas. And I hope that somehow maybe people doing social choice and, and others would be interested to try to, to expand the, the um, theory in that direction, which I think is very important because the rest of economics again, over the past 30, 40 years, has been very much focused on asymmetric information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah, so that's something that is, so there's surprisingly also rather little that is known about the shape of this interim incentive uh, efficiency frontier. So I do have a couple of results. I skipped that slide which is telling when you are sure that, they, that it will exist, okay? So there are conditions, for instance, that are telling you um, actually what you can say. I don't know how much you are learning from generic conditions, but you can show that when you have more than three players, there's a condition on the beliefs, which is generic on these beliefs, which is going to guarantee that the solution, that, that the problem is simple. It's actually a bit related to the talk that uh, Claude Dapremont will be presenting. So there's some work being done trying to understand what is feasible uh, in, at the interim stage and under these conditions, which happen to be generic, but again, in terms of the beliefs, uh, when you have more than three players, then you know that it will always exist. But there's still more work even to be done just on that question, which is let's try to better understand the shape of this convex polyhedra of what is feasible. And actually, beyond the fact that it's a convex polyhedra, there's very little work on that. Yes. Uh, you could think of a generalized, of a weighted egalitarian solution, okay. where weights, for example, can come from the priors on the types. Yes. Uh, which may be, again, uh, types that have low probability, I may care less. That, 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 so yes. that may, there may be a way to axiomatize something, and you're going to get the weights uh, in some way, perhaps even endogenously, from, from some yes. so additional axiom. That relates that. So there's something like that where I told you there's a, a result about combining. So there's this classic approach by Arzani and taken after that by Shapley on this lambda transfer. So it's the idea. So that would be the endogenous. So, so that would be the fixed point. In the yeah. So actually, what is coming out of it, if you combine exactly. I'm still, I'm still the for the egalitarian one, yeah. Where, where, I, where uh, I don't know, where, where weights are fixed and not endogenous in the Yes. And I think because you're comparing different types of the same player. It may make sense to have to have a weighted rather than a it, completely. It may, solution. it may, but I don't know. I don't have enough intuition. No, it would be it would be interesting. I mean, but yeah. but think of the gate solution as an idea of like the basic principle of egalitarianism does not have weight, right? So you have these classic examples of if you have like two islands and you know like this one of them will be destroyed and on one island there's one person, on the one there's a hundred. You don't weight, right? You just say that you are going to flip a coin and any of these two islands is equally good for a pure egalitarianist. But then, of course, maybe you want to, to do an alternative. Also equality among my different types. That's a different, different you are, the equality across different types is, said. well, it's coming as a corollary of equality. So actually, if you have equality across individuals at each possible piece of information, it will come as a corollary, right? So if, if I have, but I'm not imposing it. So if I have TI equal, okay, so. I'm saying that that's a changing action, but trying to think perhaps. Yes, it's a good idea. It's a good idea. Yeah. And then one can may, of course, go to the Arsani and having weights being determined endogenously. That will be the next step. But first, we have to understand what the weighted are with fixed weights and trying to think what are those weights. I don't know. Yes, it's a good idea. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.